Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Timothy Snowball, attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation, author of uh, uh, Rewire, Rewire and Rekill, <laughs> Kill and, and Aristocracy, and, soon to and come out, and development officer at Pacific Legal all. Foundation. Yes. Thank you for being on the show. We're on uh, Access Sacramento, uh, cable TV, Channel 17 in Sacramento. We're on YouTube. We're on the, the web at uh, uh, www.accesssacramento.org, Channel 17, and of course on, on Facebook. Uh, and uh, the uh, show is Libertarian Counterpoint, so let's talk about what the Libertarian Party does to raise money. And one thing that it does is it accepts Bitcoin <laughs> as a contribution. Now, they've been doing it since, oh, man, way back. When did, when did Bitcoin start? Back in 2009 or something like that? It's been doing it for a long time, six, seven years, you know, a couple of years after Bitcoin started. And we're asked by uh, don donors to the... About that time, a, uh, a blogger for uh, for Huffington Post, I think, or, or no, Slate, a, blo a blogger for Slate said that Bit Bitcoin is nothing but a, a libertarian dream. <laughs> and well, okay, Libertarian Party, we'll we'll accept that uh, mm -hmm. that challenge. The uh, FEC, Federal Election Commission, said, yeah, well, you know, it's okay for Bitcoin to be uh, donated as long as it's uh, no more than a cash limit of a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. That was a, a unanimous opinion. And then they split three to three, uh, Democrats against Republicans, on whether or not it was uh, possible to uh, accept a donation over $100, up to the uh, what are now limits uh, of donations to a party of $10,000 mm -hmm. for a party uh, for one day or 33000 something for, for a year or over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. But the Libertarian Party took that, uh, that uh, uh, non-resolved decision, split decision or split, you know, no decision, to say, okay, we'll just go ahead and do it, you know, and let the chips fall where they weigh, let the, let the bitcoins clank where they land. <laughs> if they clanked. Uh, yeah, except you know, bitcoins. Give us a little bit about, uh, tell, <laughs> tell, tell, tell me about bitcoin and, and how, how it has value. Um, I'm putting you on the spot. Good, good, yes, good, you are. Good question. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's a, let, let's just take that question and, and, and really dissect it for the next 22 <laughs> minutes so I don't have to answer it. I, um, uh, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, and it is not a currency that is backed by the faith and credit of any um, government entity. It is a, a, a currency that basically um, derives its value from what people are willing to pay for it and what goods and services you can acquire from it. And it is, um, exists in uh, really the, the web. Um, and Arist uh, Aristotle defined a currency as something that has, that's scarce, mm -hmm. that has intrinsic value, that is uh, portable, and one other attribute, I forget what it was, but you know, basically four attributes. Most fiat currencies, dollar, yen, euro, yeah. and so forth, have all of those things. Gold has all four. Mm -hmm. Most fiat currencies have all three except for intrinsic value because mm -hmm. the intrinsic value is not, there is no intrinsic value because central banks can print more dollars, yen, euro, or whatever at will. Witness Zimbabwe and, and the $100 quadrillion dollar, uh, you know, banknotes that were worth a slice of bread. A slice of bread. So, there is no intrinsic value to dollars. Bitcoin does have an intrinsic value because they have limited the supply to 21 million bitcoins. That's it. Once there are 21 million print, uh, you know, mined by computer algorithms, and don't ex ask me to explain that. That's it. There are well, only 21 million. It, Richard. I think there are only 21 million in existence possible. So, so it, it does have intrinsic so value. So every according to what though, what controls that? Just the. I the don't Bitcoin ask me. Gods, the, I mean. Yeah, no, the the algorithm that uh, the uh, the magic f 
computer programming that created the Bitcoin in the first place. I don't know. <laughs> well, I so that would mean at uh, $21 million, at $10,000, that means that there's $210 billion Do worth Do that math in your head Bit real quick. Bitcoin yeah. out there. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it can go up. I mean, right now, prognosticators are saying, you know, it's what, $14,000 today or something? No, well, in that case, there's, there's more. There's yeah, but I mean, what, what's it, what, what could happen is it could go up infinitely in value, in dollar value. Mm. But the number of Bitcoins will always be the same, mm. or will never be more. Kind of like shares right. in Berkshire Hathaway. It's gone up pretty much infinitely in value because he's limited the number of shares and created scarcity. So, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. any any stock that does any any corporation that doesn't continually create new stock mm -hmm. would be in the same situation. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the the I think the reason people don't like me, I I quite frankly don't understand the cryptocurrency. I don't understand how how in this day and age of hackers and all the rest that that um, the currency can remain secure. But what I can guarantee is that. It is certainly more secure than the U.S. dollar at the hands of people who print money. So, if I had a choice between owning, you know, ten thousand U.S. dollars and one Bitcoin at this point, I would certainly decide, especially if it's fourteen thousand dollars right now, to uh, to have a. Bitcoin. You're not you're not afraid of buying at the top of the bubble. Huh? Well, you know that you and you and I both know because we've been investing for a lot of years that you never know what the top's going to be. <laughs> We, we Markets have, can go up and up for yeah, longer than you long can believe, and they can go down and down for, for longer, longer than you can than imagine. You can believe, yeah. yeah. And you and I have both experienced a lack of optimism or a lack of pessimism. Back in the back in the nineties, was lack of optimism uh, during the bit or the uh, the internet bubble and yeah. during the uh, uh, well, you know how it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think I, I I am very optimistic that the whole cryptocurrency, um, and you can even put the barter economy uh, in the same thing, um, is going to take the, the power of fiat currency away from a lot of these massive governments that are really just printing money and, and kind of force them to um, mind their, you know, keep house a little bit better than they are. As more and more people go to, um, non-government sponsored monetary units to exchange for goods and services. I think it's going to force the, the government to do one of two things. First thing it's going to do is try to make them illegal, of course, because that's what governments do. But the second thing I think it's going to make them do is... Well, that's, uh, of course, what they're already trying yeah, to do trying in many to, cases. I think the that, question, of course, yeah. is whether or not they'll be, whether or not that will, in fact, be possible, mm -hmm. since it exists on the web. On multiple well, they, hundreds you of know, thousands of our, our, our government under Richard Nixon, who was elected as a, as a Republican, uh, made you know possession of gold, or mm -hmm. at, at times not Nixon, but took us off the gold standard. But at times yeah, well, in Roosevelt this country, took us off the gold Rose, Roosevelt made, 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 made us turn in our gold. Made people there's, turn there's, in gold. There's, how can you turn in Something cryptocurrency? That you can't. Well, yeah. You can't but find it. But it's interesting because under under the uh, Commerce Clause, Congress has the power to regulate anything that has a substantial impact upon interstate interstate commerce. So if people are using Bitcoin or right. cryptocurrency, right? My question, not, not whether the government has constitutional how, authority, how they would do it, whether or not it is r feasible, practically yeah. possible for government, you know, our government or any other government, to actually take over. Computers all over the all over the all over the globe. Well, the government has, and has never underestimated the power of the government to regulate. Yeah, we'll see. We'll well, see. The, the government has tried to regulate, for example, uh, a weed that grows in ditches uh, all over <laughs> yeah. the country. How well has that worked out? And uh, and they failed miserably. But in in their failing, they've established really probably a hundred thousand more cops and a hundred more prisons than they need in the court system. And a very, and very rich thrown, underworld. Uh, thrown people in jail. Growing, so growing we, rich off of the yeah, fact that yeah. the, uh, the marijuana is an illegal. Uh, and right now they're, they're, they're trying to regulate an innocuous gas that helps uh, plants grow because <laughs> some people believe that it's, uh, it's uh, heating up the earth. So okay. don't, don't, uh, don't exaggerate the, the ability of the, the uh, government to think logically about things, okay. Richard. Uh, well, how about this for logic? Um, the uh, uh, state of Colorado uh, wrote in, uh, wrote a, uh, put together a civil rights commission which mm -hmm. says that if you are a public accommodation, if you are uh, selling goods or services to the public, you cannot discriminate on the basis of race and sex and sexual orientation. 
So a baker in uh, Denver, I think it was, decided he would, uh, ba he would not uh, can, uh, agree to bake a cake for a gay couple who wanted to have a wedding cake for a reception uh, in, 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 in Colorado. That case is now, was now, is now being uh, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, should, what are the arguments for and against, from a constitutional standpoint, uh, baking a cake, or being forced to bake a cake by, uh, that you don't want to bake? Okay. Uh, so I, John, okay. I, I um, in this case, the, if you were to, to watch a video of this man, his cakes aren't cakes in the sense that you and I think of cakes. Even people think of wedding cakes. That he, he is an artist, and his art, um, he is an artist in many ways, but, but his art is his cakes, and his artistic expression is his cake. So you're, basically, this is not about cake. This is about forcing an artist to provide a product um, that, that is not in alignment with his artistic principles, with his desire to, um, to represent his ideals and ideas to the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the Trying problem. Trying to force Michelangelo to do a Cubist painting? Is that <laughs> Pretty much, okay. in this case. If you were to see the video of his cakes and watch this man, the man's a deep re religious man, uh, and, and he um, doesn't have a problem with, with uh, coexisting with uh, people who are gay. He doesn't, he has, uh, um, Commerce of a different nature, but what the government has done is not only have they, they told him that that um, that he's wrong in not baking this cake or making this cake, creating this piece of art. What they've told him is that because he won't create this one piece of art, that uh, I think more than half of his business at his bakery is in creating these beautiful pieces of art that are wedding cakes. He is no longer allowed to practice that trade. So he has. So uh, the, the, they've told him he can't. He cannot. He can't, be, he can't make, make wedding, wedding cakes. cakes. That's an and interesting. Oh, sorry, it's an interesting thing because you, you, on the one hand, you've got the what John's talking about—the First Amendment, the speech-based argument. Well, and there's. Then there's, he also mentioned the free the free exercise yeah. argument, which is should someone have the right to um, to choose who they're going to accommodate in their business based upon you know the freedom of conscience. Freedom well, there's, of there's actually three First Amendment issues: freedom of speech. Uh, free exercise of religion and freedom of association, right. the right to assemble, uh, and he's choosing not to associate, at least in in an artistic sense, with uh, people who are uh, practicing a uh, marital practice of which his religion disapproves. So he has the right, it would seem to me, and we'll see what the Supreme. I mean, the Supreme Court case, the arguments to the court were pretty much on on uh, free speech and and uh, and. Uh, not on, uh, I don't think anybody made the association, freedom of association arguments. But that's really the elephant in the room, whether you have the right to associate with those with whom you want to associate, which the reciprocal of that is not being forced to associate right. with folks you don't want to associate well, this, with, for whatever case, reason. This, case, this is forced speech. Well, it's forced, it's forced speech and forced association. And He's forced to do business with people he doesn't want the, to do business the with. Other, the other no. side of this is it, he's it, now missing two or three employees who right. are gainfully employed in his business, in his very successful, thriving business right. that worked for him for years because a judge decided that because he won't make this cake, this wedding cake, he can't make any wedding cake. Something like 40% of his uh, annual revenue, I think he said. This was a Yes. Okay. So the, the case is going to the Supreme Court. It's in the Supreme Court. Yeah, it, it, well, yes, it's, it was argued a, couple, argued, uh, a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll take a few months for, for the court to make its decision. Mm -hmm. Will the justices, will any of the justices make the freedom of, you know, even though it wasn't really argued, will any of the justices pick up on the freedom of association uh, aspect to the case? I haven't looked at the brief. If, uh, yeah, I have a little cursory. I, I apologize for not yeah. looking at okay. the brief, but I don't. And I don't the other think thing, the other, the other interesting was, thing yeah. about all of you know, all of this discrimination stuff started with the Federal Civil Rights Act of 1964. Mm -hmm. The Federal Civil Rights of, uh, Act of 1964 said no racial discrimination, essentially, and, and no uh, discrimination based on, on uh, male female. But if you remember the context of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, it was it was written because we were coming off the era of Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. The era of Jim Crow was an era where the government 
forced people to discriminate. Mm -hmm. Jim Crow laws said you will not serve blacks in your restaurant and mm -hmm. on, in, you know with the same in the same in, in the same side of the restaurant as whites. Well, in the southern states, you will, right? yeah, in southern states, that's where it applied. And you will not County. you will not allow whites and blacks to use the same bathroom. On and on and on. It was government laws, with you know punishable by by fines and, and imprisonment that forced people to discriminate whether they wanted to or not. Mm -hmm. Finally, got rid of the Jim Crow laws. I mean, the culture changed. The culture said this is wrong. The people of the country said this is this is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The Jim Crow laws were gradually uh, either ignored or repealed. The Civil Rights Act came along to say you know to drive a nail into the coffin, but it was the culture that changed before the law changed. It wasn't the law that changed the culture. It was it was the mm -hmm. other way around. It was culture changing the law. And the Libertarians, our first candidate for president, John Hospers, back in 1972, was an openly gay man. This was back before being gay was cool. Mm -hmm. He was an openly gay man. He ran for president, first presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party. And we have been in favor of the gay marriage uh, Supreme Court case, which says that you, uh, you know, the equal, uh, equal protection law, the 14th Amendment says you cannot discriminate on the basis of uh, sexual orientation as far as granting marriage licenses. Uh, we think that Offered All was a step in the right direction, but it's not the be all and end all because if you go back in history before the 1920s, marriage was not licensed. There was no license required for marriage in the United States. It was a church matter. It was a matter that you know, had nothing to do with the government other than enforcing the marital contract. Now you've got licensing, and you've got essentially the federal government, or the state government in this case, the state government essentially using a one-size-fits-all contract. Mm -hmm. And that's what marriage is. It's a contract bef between two people mm -hmm. in most cases. You, I don't think there's any three-way marriages yet. But it's there a contract. Be. It's a contract oh, between, between two people, may, may, uh, straight, you know, gay or straight, doesn't make any difference. But it's one contract. You can't, you know, you and me deciding to get married, heaven forbid, is something uh, that yes, yes, is something careful. that we Known couldn't this write. Guy Twenty-seven years, not happening, folks. We couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't write the terms of the contract. We'd have to <laughs> accept contract language written by the government, in effect. Well, we have we've had this discussion before, and and that marriage is is uh, basically it's a contractual agreement between. And the in licensing, time, yeah. the licensing uh, process started as anti—I'm going to mispronounce this word—miscegenation Mis laws. Mis Basically, anti-mixed uh, marriage laws. Right. They were racist laws to prevent whites from marrying blacks. That's where licensing got started. Mm -hmm. That's why it got started. Mm -hmm. And get rid of the licensing. You know, get get government out of the business well, I think it's of be regulating very, marriages. Let it's be, people yeah. that want to get married, whether they're gay, straight, or otherwise. Come to an agreement, let the role of government be to enforce the marital contract that individual uh, married couples come up with on their own. And I think you're going to see, um, especially in the, the, the change in culture that we're going through right now, where people's views toward sexuality and the very ideas of marriage are much more fluid than they were in the past, at least in Judeo-Christian Western civilization. You're going to see group marriage. You're going to see, you know, uh, contractually uh, limited marriage, like a five-year marriage, and all the rest of that. It's going to be very hard for anybody to say that those contracts uh, can't be enforced when, when you're, you're not going to be able to limit it to okay, it's okay for a heterosexual couple, a homosexual couple. Um, it's going to be very hard to, to put a stake in the ground and say that's the box that marriage is in. So. They really, as you said, the only the only way to to make right by it is to remove the government from the marriage business altogether, and and I think since we're still talking about cake as art, um, forcing people to uh, to do business to associate with people they don't associate with is is blatantly a violation of our constitution. Free exercise clause. Freedom of speech clause and the right to associate all being violated by this uh, Colorado, yep. uh, Colorado Judge be Civil Rights Commission, yeah. and uh, and it should not happen. In Oxnard, uh, libertarians have successfully launched the largest city council recall in the nation's history, uh, and I, I think that's kind of interesting because it was largest city council recall. Mm -hmm. 
I think six of seven people are, are being recalled, launched by libertarians. Uh, and you know, there's this old saying: they at first they laughed at us, then they uh, attacked us, and now they're afraid, and, now, and now we're winning, <laughs> mm. winning in Oxnard. Well, it, if uh, if if a hundred years from now, history of this country is rewritten back to what the the views of the founding fathers, which is basically what the libertarians are trying to do, um, is remove. All well, with, of the, this. with the with the exception of slavery and women not being able to vote. Yeah. Well. Um, the founding fathers weren't perfect. Yeah. So they they were they were. Uh, I talked to a a, a donor recently. Um, actually, I heard a message, a voicemail message from a donor, and you know our constitution is not perfect, but but she uh, was recalling a lecture in um, I think it was a Harvard lecture by by a, a professor of law, who said, "Think about um, how astounding this is that a country." like no other anywhere on the planet was created out of thin air on four large pieces of paper. And, and still, it's by far the, the best form of government, even though imperfect, that's ever been created anywhere on the planet. If we were to just limit it to those four pieces of paper instead of the literally millions of pages of regulations and rules that are stifling uh, life as we, we would like to have it in this country. So, not perfect, but a wonderful thing. Uh, a moment of silence for the <laughs> profound words. Uh, <clears throat> in Wisconsin, a libertarian uh, is running against uh, Doug LaFollet to a uh, Doug LaFollet, okay, backstory. I w w did a talk radio show in Racine, Wisconsin, back in the 19, early, 19, early, 19, <laughs> early 1970s. Okay? <coughs> Doug Follett was running for Congress at that time. He was running in a primary contest uh, as a Democrat against Les Aspen. Les Aspen won, became a congressman, stayed in Congress for a number of years, eventually became uh, 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 Bill Clinton's Secretary of Defense, and, uh, and has since passed away. That shows how, and he was a young guy at the time, that shows how old Doug LaFollette must be, and he's still holding office. Mm. So, you know, secretary of something or another in a statewide office that doesn't do anything. So the Libertarian is running to win the office. And he's a, he's a, a local Madison sports guy, a sportscaster. Mm. He's a, you know, a well-known name in, the, uh, in, the, in, in Madison, at least. And what office is it? It's a secretary of something or another. I, I, not, you, know, a, 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 you know, a constitutional office that doesn't do anything. Uh, I forget. What I think well, a lot of them are secretary of something or other. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing to me is that somebody whose name is LaFollette, and that's his only claim to fame, because he's a, he's a, a shirt tail relative of the progressive fighting Bob LaFollette from back in the 1910s or 20s. That's his only claim to fame. I mean, I, this guy was a complete idiot when I knew him back in the, back in the 70s, and I'm sure he hasn't improved with age. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's still in office doing essentially nothing. Getting paid. Getting paid, and I salute the libertarian that's running against him. His entire platform is to abolish the office. If elected, I will do nothing. <laughs> and won't get paid for it because the office won't be there anymore. Because the guy he's I will trying do everything to replace, I can. Yeah, I'll do everything it probably I can is doing it. nothing but getting paid for it. Well, okay. Richard, let me ask you this. Yeah. This is something I've often been curious about when it comes to um, libertarian politics and libertarians becoming involved in trying to seek elective office. It seems to me that libertarianism as a philosophy, as a, as a worldview, um, embraces kind of the idea of, of limited government, of, of there being rules in place to limit the ability of government to, uh, government power to do harm. But when the founders made the Constitution and, and, and built this country, the idea with a lot of the institutions was, we're going to kind of build these institutions to offset each other because ultimately individuals will seek power, and individuals placed in the positions of power will seek to maximize their own power and their own interest. So it always kind of seemed like a, a bit of a conflict for me. I'm just wondering if a libertarian was to um, achieve high office, would we expect because of the principles on which they ran for that to be self-limiting, or would we have to count on some of those institutional rules? to hopefully work as the founders. Well, no, I mean, the, the, the checks and balances that the founders tried to put in place, you know, the uh, two houses of Congress, 
uh, the, the 17th Amendment got rid of it, but the, uh, the idea of, of uh, state election of senators as opposed to a direct election of senators, uh, the uh, three branches of government, you know, all, all of those things worked to limit the amount of power that the federal government had. And uh, unfortunately, we've, you know, through case law and through essentially an erosion of constitutional, original constitutional principles, a lot of that has gone away. Now we have uh, a, uh, a situation where Congress doesn't really write laws anymore so much as they say, I would like a good thing to happen. Right. I will appoint an agency to make the good thing happen. You guys write the law. Well, I guess that's my point when it comes to, to democracy, yeah. to elections. A lot of politicians, I would say most politicians, win elections by promising by to do pro something. By promising promising to do, do something for you. So if your philosophy is, I think government should do less, mm -hmm. and if I get into office, I, will do I am going to do less, yeah. how is that, does, do, you ever, do you ever convert that into a winning platform? That, well, that's that's of course the conundrum. It would work for me. I'll tell <laughs> yeah, you that. that's the conundrum. Somebody said you got the Cameron vote. Yeah, so would, if you take it, if you look if you look at the at the at the at the I uh, vote a lot. If you look at the at, at the um, the um, percentages of the electorate, you got about twenty five percent that are hard, that are left, or you know either hard mm -hmm. left or soft left, wanting the government to provide stuff, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's health care or social security or you know uh, uh, disability cradle, payments, cradle, whatever. Cradle to grave. Cradle to grave kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's about 25% of the party, of, of the electorate. You've got about 35% that's hard right, and they want the government to essentially enforce their moral code, whether it's uh, re you know, re religiosity or uh, whatever it is. They want the government to make everybody like them. So you've got the hard right wanting to make the government more conservative. You've got the hard left wanting to make the government more liberal. But you've got about 20% or maybe as high as 44%, depending on how it's defined, of people who are libertarian who say, I want the government to leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Now, that has the potential to be a majority. There's a potential majority of people who would say, I don't want whatever you're trying to give me. Just let me keep my money and let me, let me take care of myself. Mm -hmm. And that is a, section, you know, a percentage of the left the people who don't think we should be going to war all mm -hmm. you know for nothing it's a percentage of the right who say get the hell out of my bedroom mm -hmm. and it's a percentage of a uh, pretty large percentage of people who now call themselves independent mm -hmm. who who instinctively know that the government isn't doing anything to help them that's the bottom line is whether or not the government despite all the promises of the politicians mm -hmm. i am here to help they're not <laughs> We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place. Government's <laughs> not here to help you folks. Don't believe them. Thank you very much. See you next week.